In late spring 1965, when I was a junior at Lincoln Southeast High School in Lincoln, Nebraska, I acquired 280 5 inch by 7 inch glass negatives from my friend Doug Boylson and his father Axel, who had found them as a result of a want ad looking for antiques and specifically anything to do with Edison record players. I made contact prints of some of the negatives in a makeshift darkroom in my parents' basement and discovered one of the prints was of a little girl standing beside an Edison phonograph. As I continued making prints, I discovered that many of the photographs were of the African American and immigrant community in Lincoln, Nebraska around 1915. The negative sat until 1999 when a woman in Lincoln who was doing research on the African American community discovered a box of glass negatives tucked away in a closet that were first thought to be taken by an African American photographer named Earl McWilliams. I soon realized that the glass negatives I had were probably taken by the same photographer. Both the local and national media got a hold of the story and eventually the Smithsonian Institution acquired 60 prints made from the negatives. After having the negatives for 36 years, the actual name of the photographer was finally revealed in 2001. The lady who had introduced us to Miss Folly and Abby Anderson and I were sitting in her living room talking about these photos um, and we talked about one image of a family of four um, little girl sitting in front of mother and father and her brother standing behind them and she got up quietly went back to her bedroom came back with a box of family photos prints and hands us a print from that negative and she says this is me my father Reverend Albert Talbert my mother Millicent my brother Dakota Mr. Johnson took our photos John Johnson took our photo and then she goes on to describe that John Johnson was an active community photographer her father who was a minister at Newman Methodist Church often had Johnson come for church events picnics bazaars um, and that he was the picture man in the African-American community. Um, she kind of gently scoffed at our, um, well, we thought maybe Earl McWilliams was involved. She remembered Earl McWilliams, said she didn't remember him being, being a photographer, um, and that Mr. Johnson was a community photographer. We realized as we looked, we had, we had already identified um, some of the pictures in terms of place, and one place that showed up very often was a little house that we could identify as 1310A Street because there were wide angle views of it, there were views of the porch, there was a view of a woman standing right under the address at the front door that said 1310. We could match it up to the city maps and the footprint of the house matched perfectly and 1310A was the Johnson family home as we looked at the information. Um, we learned later it's Johnson family home from 1880 to 1953. Um, so a lot of it was coming together around uh, the Johnson work. Um, it's not impossible that Johnson, working around the community with no studio, on front porches, open air, in some interiors, um, would have had some help. Uh, it's bulky equipment, it's a big tripod, and Johnson shows up in a number of the photos. Um, so we know on certain occasions um, he probably sets up a view and somebody else releases the shutter, um, but we don't know who that is. Having better established the name of the photographer, we can now concentrate on who John Johnson was and what he was taking pictures of. Our search has been an ongoing treasure hunt full of unexpected discoveries. John Johnson may have left scant written history, but what he did leave us with is an extraordinary body of work. Why do not more young colored men and women take up photography as a career? 
the average white photographer does not know how to deal with colored skins and having neither sense of the delicate beauty or tone nor will to learn, he makes a horrible botch of portraying them. W.E.B. Dubois Johnson's photos have enabled us to turn the clock back to Lincoln, Nebraska in the early years of the 20th century. Lacking a formal studio, John Johnson used the street, porches, and parks as his studio, packing his bulky view camera, glass plates, and canvas backdrop in a horse and buggy, and documented his community in a series of extraordinary images. His lack of a formal studio is to our enduring benefit, for rather than seeing portraits of people in an artificial studio environment, John Johnson's photos show us the everyday lives of his fellow citizens, in their homes, where they worked, and where they played. His gift to us is a marvelous look at the world through his eyes. Lincoln, Nebraska was established in 1859, then secured the state capital in 1867, when its population was a scant 2,400 souls. When the University of Nebraska was chartered in 1869, it added a firm foundation for the city to grow. By the end of the 19th century, Lincoln had risen to 55,000 and was a lively and growing community. By the mid-19-teens, the city was bustling with a building boom. Johnson stepped into this vibrant community with a keen eye and a bulky glass plate camera with which he'd document almost everything around him. After the Civil War, large numbers of Germans from Russia immigrants moved into an area in southwest Lincoln called the South Bottoms which became known to many as Russian Bottoms. These hard-working people came from southeastern Russia along the Volga River. Although they were now Americans, they carried on many of the traditions of their old homeland. In the South Bottoms, people speaking German were almost as likely to be found as those speaking English. By the latter part of the 19th century, other immigrants as well as African Americans, many of them from the southern states, moved into Russian bottoms. Both the German Russians and the African Americans suffered from discrimination and prejudice. But because of their mutual struggle for equality, they found themselves oddly bound together. Many of the homes in South Bottoms remain much the same a century later, making it fairly easy to imagine what they looked like in Johnson's time. Johnson posed his neighbors on porches, outside their homes, and even took photos of window washers, which they used to advertise their business. By the beginning of the 20th century, Lincoln's African-American community numbered 1,500 out of a total population of 55,000. At the time, much of America was awash in negative stereotypes of African Americans. Those negative stereotypes turned into hatred fueled by groups like the Ku Klux Klan. Lincoln even briefly had its own clavern, which existed until the mid-1920s. But most of the stereotypes of African Americans were more subtle, like portraying African Americans as shiftless, comical, and ignorant. However, despite the rampant discrimination, things were beginning to change. And that change was what John Johnson so eloquently captured. To combat the negative stereotypes, there emerged a social revolution called the New Negro Movement, which later became better known as the Harlem Renaissance. Much of the credit for the birth of the New Negro Movement goes to reformers like W.E.B. Du Bois, Elaine Locke, and intellectuals and artists in big cities. But in fact, it was a nationwide movement. 
And nowhere was the spirit of equality and casting off negative stereotypes better depicted than in Lincoln, Nebraska. Aaron Douglas, one of the artists most cited as proponents of the New Negro Movement and the Harlem Renaissance, lived and was educated in Lincoln, Nebraska. He had uh, received his art education at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln and was here uh, late teens, graduated in I think 1921 with a Bachelor in Fine Arts. Uh, sometimes when you read about Aaron Douglas, it sounds like he somehow escaped Kansas and got to New York City and there drank the water and became a genius. He was a trained, he was an academic artist with his education, um, high school in Kansas and then and his collegiate years were at University of Nebraska Lincoln. At the very time, Johnson is taking um, his photos, and I can't prove it for a legal certainty, but I can identify in some of the Johnson group shots of young people in uh, park setting, looks like a Sunday afternoon church group, um, and I think I can spot in two of the images young Aaron Douglas, and we have his high school graduation picture, we have his college graduation picture, so we know the man's face at that point in his youth, and um, I think Aaron Douglas is in John Johnson's pictures. I, I, I'm always careful to say I don't think John Johnson made Aaron Douglas the artist he became, but I do think his education here in Nebraska was a key factor in him becoming the artist he became, and both of these men are in the arts, in the visual arts, at the same moment in the small community of Lincoln, Nebraska in the late teens, early 20s. I think what it really tells us is the New Negro movement was nationwide, that these aren't wealthy middle class or upper class people in occupation or in material goods, and the presentation, the enormous dignity that, that is apparent in so many of the pictures is something that the subject and Johnson together are, are producing as the true image um, that they want to portray, and that is New Negro Movement. That, that we've got a lovely picture, of two pictures um, of a woman standing on a front porch or sitting reading a book. Uh, we were able to identify her as um, Mamie Griffin. Her house is a little tiny house on a dirt street with a junkyard next to it, and this woman is beautifully dressed, holds a book proudly, so you, you know she's a reader. Um, spectacular image and attitude captured in these pictures. And the work she can obtain, dignified work, but menial work, she's a cook um, in, a, in the community. It isn't what you look at this picture and say, I'm pretty sure I see a cook here. This is a lady um, dressed to the nines and, and just spectacular views, half this big. Um. There ain't nothing I can do Or nothing I can say That folks don't criticize as I want to anyway And I don't care what people say If I should take a notion to jump into the ocean It ain't nobody's business if I do If I go to church on Sunday Then cabaret all day Monday It ain't nobody's business if I do
If my friend ain't got no money And I say, well, take all of mine, honey It ain't nobody's business if I do Oh, no If I give him my last nickel And it leaves me in a pickle It ain't nobody's business if I do If I do John Johnson didn't shy away from tough subjects. An area near Lincoln's train station was known as the Burnt District. Here lived the ultra-poor and Lincoln's prostitutes. But Johnson used his lens to look past their circumstances and into their soul. There is still much to learn about the people and locations in John Johnson's photographs. Each discovery adds another piece to a jigsaw puzzle without a complete picture on the box. But what we do know is that the more pieces we find, the more marvelous the picture of John Johnson's world looks. The core of Johnson's images are his evocative portraits. From them spins a rich tapestry of hope and promise.
What we have seen, thanks to John Johnson's insightful eye, is not just the flowering of a segment of a community, but the broad texture of a diverse and growing city in America's heartland. While it is true that the full flowering of the new Negro movement and the Harlem Renaissance occurred in large cities, it was fueled and supported by what came from America's heart. Many of the people and locations in Johnson's images remain a mystery, but what is not a mystery is that John Johnson will now take his place among America's great early 20th century photographers. And it is all thanks to a father and his son who found a shadowy glass negative of a little girl standing next to a wind-up Edison phonograph, and their friend, just up the street, who was experimenting with photography in his parents' basement in Lincoln, Nebraska. But our story isn't over. After Johnson's death in 1953, his friends in the community distributed the photos that were in his house. Then, in 1955, the house and its outbuilding were torn down, removing any hope of finding more prints in his basement, attic, or tucked away in closets. But many of his photographs are out in the world, waiting to be discovered and identified. They are in family albums, bins in antique stores, and forgotten trunks in grandma's basement. Some are even on bureau tops, waiting for someone to say, that's my grandmother when she was a young woman. I've always wondered who took that. It's incredible. <laughs>